For Krima Media's Policy, I'm Sane Lamini. A veteran South African journalist, John Mattison, joins me to discuss his book, God, Spies and Lies. Welcome, John. Thank you. Can you briefly unpack the book's title, God, Spies and Lies, for a person who might, who might be interested in reading the book? Well, um, Sunny, it's really designed to be the kind of book that uh, anybody who wants to really understand how we got to where we are in South Africa, the good and the bad, that takes in the role of the ANC, but also the, all, the, all the actors, good and bad, um, and written in a readable way, so it's very absorbing. It tells stories of people who often were never known about, but were incredibly important. Uh, we'll come to it later, but for instance, my discussions with Madiba, uh, President Nelson Mandela, about a friend of mine who was a friend of his, Charles Bloomberg, uh, but he's never been known in the public very much. But they were cr crucial, their relationship was one of the elements that give us an understanding of how Madiba uh, um, thought about strategize to end apartheid. And then it goes right forward to the president, pre to, sorry, excuse me, to the present, to look at how we got to where we are, what we did right in the 21 years uh, of democracy, and why we, things aren't working now, and how we can fix it. And tell me, in the beginning of the book, you mentioned that President Jacob Zuma bankrupted Nelson Mandela's ruling ANC. Why do you say that? Well, when I say bankrupted, I mean, I say morally and politically. And I mean, I don't think many people disagree anymore. When I started writing this book, I think a lot of people might not have wanted to accept what I'm saying, but now it's become more and more commonly accepted that President Zuma doesn't have a vision for the country. He doesn't give leadership when, there's a, when there are crises, you know, whether it's the students or whatever. Um, imagine what Madiba would have done if students were, were, were demonstrating and there were these problems. He would, have brought, he would have come out and he would have acted, he would have thought, he would have met all the relevant uh, players and he would have taken action. And, and then finally, of course, with um, corruption. Corruption has just risen enormously in the last few years. And you had the privilege of meeting very influential people like Nelson Mandela. How was it like to have a conversation with Mandela? Well, you know, I mean, you can't say anything to persuade me that he was not a great man. Um, if, you know, I've met a lot of famous people in America and elsewhere, presidents and senators and all of that. And many of them, when you meet them, you, you, don't, think, you don't think so much after you meet them. Mandela was the opposite. The more you talked to him, the more you realized he was a man who concentrated on you. He thought about what you were saying. He remembered who you were and what the interaction was. My, my interactions with him, I would say, were different from a lot of what I've read about because I didn't know him well, but the interactions we had were quite intense. I mean, for instance, I said, you know, uh, I read that you're not bitter. That doesn't quite make sense. And he wasn't very explicit, but it was clear to me from what he said that, of course, he was bitter. But he, what he did say, he said, I just don't have time, John. He, this was before he became president. He knew he, what he wanted to achieve. And he knew that he didn't have time for those things. It wasn't because he wasn't, didn't feel the pain. Do you think it's fair for our government to try and regulate the media? Well, regulating the media in the right way through the you know broadcast licenses and all that is fine, but the the, the talk about a media tribunal and so on, it won't work. Uh, it was tried under the apartheid government. It it it. It, it does a lot of damage because it means people don't know as much as they should know. They're not d debating freely. But, it, but e especially now in the age of the internet and things like polity, uh, it's not going to work. You referred to Charles Bumbeck as one of South Africa's most interesting and influential figures that are forgotten. Why do you say that? Well, uh, uh, I can only give you a brief version. You have to read the book. But essentially, Charles Bloomberg set out to break open the, 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 the uh, monolith of the apartheid regime 
and he uh, uh, exposed the Brudebund, and then he fled the country. So, and he did it without using his name. And that's an example. Can you just share what were the challenges of being a reporter during the apartheid time? Well, you, you had to, first of all, I think it, it made us very careful to double check and triple check our facts. Because if you got something wrong, you were in terrible trouble. I mean, my phone was bugged from the age of about 20 or 21 you know, for the whole time of the apartheid era. I was blacklisted by the SABC. I was never allowed on. I fought c court cases with them constantly. Look, I was lucky. A lot of people had more trouble than me, people like Zulaki, Sasulu, many others. But he was a good friend of mine. And um, um, uh, so th having a profile in the press did help you to some extent. And obviously, I was white, and that was easier than being Zulaki. Um, Sasulu, uh, who was a very great journalist, um, but but you were constantly on edge. I was I was barred from Parliament. I was jailed a couple of times, um, and and you were constantly on edge. Talking about the SAPC, you ran the election coverage during the 1994 democratic elections. What was the atmosphere like? Oh, it was terrific because everybody was. It just felt it was like. Uh, uh, the, the days when things things were going to change, the things we could never believe we would see happen, were happening. Um, but but in the SABC, what was interesting is, I mean, you had the old apartheid people still there, and I took the decision. I said, I don't have time to fire anybody. What matters is you, you're either on board or get out of the way. Because we came in, things were so tense. You know, we I, I was only there for three months. And the election campaign was already starting. I said, what we want to do is to turn the state propaganda broadcaster into an independent public broadcaster serving the people, the ordinary people. You must switch on TV and listen to the radio and see people like yourself. Mm. And we did that, and it was very exciting. You also had access to, to documents that are unseen until now on various backroom deals on, and maneuvers by a succession of U.S. political administrations. What was the significance of this document? Well, in the short time, I'll give you only one small example. I've got hold of a transcript of a meeting in the Oval Office in the White House uh, between President Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State, and the head of the CIA, who was then George Herbert Walker Bush. In other words, the man who became the first President Bush. Uh, the father of uh, George W. Bush. And in that, uh, Bush gave a briefing as head of the CIA that their information said, you have to change your policy of support for the white whites in Rhodesia and Ian Smith, and you have to reverse it. And he spelt out why. And for me, that was very exciting to come across. And tell me, you've mentioned that President Jacob Zuma stayed in your house, and you've worked with Nels in the Nelson Mandela government. Can you tell us what has gone wrong in government and business? Yes, uh, that's, that's such an important uh, question, Sonny. Um, to start off with, a lot of things were d done correctly. Uh, we, in my job as, as a broadcast regulator, as councillor from the Independent Broadcasting Authority, we opened all the radio stations and TV stations. Virtually every radio station you listen to now was licensed in those first couple of years, and it was done honestly. And, and with uh, increased black and female participation in the ownership and the content and all of those things was done very consciously, but very openly and above board and accountably. Things have changed and, and it's, it started, I would say, in the Mbeki years, but of course it got much worse under President Zuma. So that if business deal try to talk at the highest level about a, a thing in the national interest, it's very hard to get things done. But if you come with a bribe and you, and you bribe the right person in government, things seem to be very easy. And that is, I think, the nub of the problem. That's what we have to turn around in South Africa, and we must. And lastly, please, please tell us your predictions about the upcoming elections in South Africa. Yes, well, we have municipal elections this year, all the cities, um, the metros, I think the Cape Town will stay with the DA. The ANC is at risk in, in, in a lot of the other big metros. In practice, they'll probably lose a majority in at least one, maybe not more. It's hard to say. But, but they're on the back foot now. They're losing support. They've lost the, the confidence of 
the black middle class, of informed people, of the intelligentsia. Um, th th they haven't maintained the respect and the interaction with academia, with black academia or white academia. And so I think they're vulnerable. And the question is, if the DA come in and form an alliance with the EFF or however it works, and anything is possible, will they be able to do it better? Do they have the skills? And that's going to be the real test because we're all South Africans. We want things to get better. And, it's, and we have to see if they are more committed to make things work right than we are seeing in some of the places now. Thank you, John, for your time. My pleasure. That was John Madison speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his book titled God, Spies and Lies.